I'm Mark Seifter. And I'm Linda Zeiss Palmer. And this is Arcane Mark. reactions to Lost Omens Mwangi Expanse. We talked about religions last time and we're going to be picking up today at the very beginning of the geography section. The geography section covers a huge swath of regions in the Mwangi Expanse from uh, from regions that are dangerous and not particular and not particularly inhabited to the greatest cities and all and everywhere in between. Yep. So let's just get started then with geography. That's going to be most of the rest of our episodes until we get into the bestiary at the end and then the glossary and index, which is, of course, very important. I mean, if you didn't have that. <laughs> and out in the secret message at the end. What about that after the OGL? Yeah, that's, that's true. Okay. That's true. So um, let's talk about this. So obviously the overall climate of the Mwangi Expanse is tropical rainforest in many of the locations very hot and there's a lot of rain that's why it's called a tropical rainforest um there's jungle but there's mountains and plains and there's always volcanic lakes there's and sodden lands with non volcanic swamps. lakes and yep the, and you know your your jungles are, are rather varied in their ways you've got your your screaming jungle which is a lot more dangerous than than some of your other locations for sure yeah, I feel like the screaming jungle is gonna be more dangerous. The barrier, than like, the barrier wall like, mountains. Like, isn't there like a a laughing jungle or something? Yeah, like and then that's there's like a, then there's a, then there's like a, the ruins of a the the ruins of a crash flying sky city. Yeah, and I there's, mean, there's all sorts of stuff. That's just going what on you here. get when you have a civilization of flying sky city people who live in the area. Is you're gonna wind up with ruins of crashed sky cities. That's just sort of collateral for that. Uh, mm -hmm. So let's start with the Bandu Hills. They are a, a very humble beginning because they start with BA, which really, if you don't have an A, means that you're going to go pretty early in the alphabet. And the Bandu Hills are just this this area that is... You know, because it's like quiet and sleepy and you don't necessarily have... Uh, it's a, it, you see like that fog that's over it, but... Uh, I don't know if you can see any of the, the any of the skulls that are rattling about yeah, it there through the mist. This is some a skulls. this is a place with quite known for its restless undead and its its heavy fog and the hungry spirits that rise against anyone who dares to tread yeah. upon. Yeah, yeah, there is there's that issue. But but you know there's also but there there's also veins of gold and mineral deposits and I mean, precious you want stones to come here? and all sorts of things that entice both uh both locals and people from much farther afield to try to to try to brave its most dangerous regions. Yep. So this is like a hill section of hills that separate the jungle and plains from um like the regular Mwangi jungle from the screaming jungle. So you've got the screaming jungle like right down there and it reaches uh, slightly into Vidrian. So you may have gotten used to going into the Bandu Hills and like some of the older adventure paths and adventures. And uh, basically there, there are some issues here because of the dead and mm -hmm. the, the, the screaming jungle but well, barkston lake is also super creepy too yeah you've got you've got That's this true. sort of these roaming groups of roaming groups of ghouls and uh mysterious humanoids known as umasi who use uh who use particular means of organ transplantation to extend their lives i think we'll see them in the best area or somewhere but yeah because they they just they kind of just need to do that because that's the way they heal like, their body doesn't heal naturally. They need to transplant other people's organs or other creatures' organs. So they wind up looking pretty weird because they could wind up with, like, you know, like a crab claw or something that they transplanted on there from a giant crab. Uh, there's also Dark Reach, which is a an inscript, uh, a stone form of a man with an inscription that says, I point the way to Zorakai, never there to return. Yeah, it's well, it's, it's the monument that towers over the, the ruins of Dark Reach, which is one of the, um, which is uh, a trading post 
that um, it's not one of those ancient ruins that, that had a long and storied history. It's a trading post that met a uh, that met a sudden and and everyone vanished and who knows what happened to the people who once lived. That's there. right. Now the mon the mysterious monument is like an old mysterious monument, but Dark Reach is itself a um, yeah is a newer trading post. There's also the Deep Treasure Mining Company because, like Linda said, there's golden gems up here. So there are people who want to to come here. And that mining company was very big in Sargava because they exploited Zorns from the elemental plane of Earth. But uh, the Vidric Revolution was not kind to them. Also, the hobgoblins from Oprak have wound up in there because of the plane of Earth-related stuff. Mm-hmm. There's a cyber here talking about this Sargava Chalice, which uh, is a foot race that um, ha that still exists, despite the fact that the name Sargava is certainly not used for the for the nation anymore. Uh, dangerous foot race that um, Pathfinder Society characters had a chance to participate in in a relatively recent scenario. That's right, and it goes through the Laughing Jungle, the Maneri Plains, and the Bandu Hills. So, hey, Bandu Hills. Mm -hmm. That little Vanji is a river that's going through the Bandu Hills and Mount Nakyuk. Don't don't assume because little is in its name. It's 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 a particularly safe river. It's oh no, of course not. It's got like piranha type giant fish. giant man eating fish. This large enough to swallow a person whole. Of course. Fierce fierce hippopotami, deadly constrictor snakes, rapids that can shred your boat. You know you don't want to be taking this river if you're someone who doesn't know what they are doing. Unless you feel like it. Yeah, adventurers are always running in first and asking questions only when they're saying, oh god, why? What did we just <laughs> run into? And then they use their high level abilities to survive it anyway. So there you go. That's right. <laughs> and so Mount Nakyuk is basically the highest point in the area. It is a... Uh, a place where you can go for mining, but your the, the ghoul kingdom of Varkskin Lake is going to notice you, and then um, also the Umasi, who are there, and you're going to have to wind up paying the toll. Mm -hmm. Then there's a few more really interesting things to denote in Bandu Hills. So, uh, and there we see the statue mysterious statue about like oh i'm pointing the way to zorakai it's like is it related to zora the demon lord maybe uh is it pointing the way to a lost aslanti city was it because zora was an aslanti ruler before she mm -hmm. became a demon lord uh i mean it wouldn't be the first lost aslanti city that was in why there. is there this monument made of a, a rock that was previously only found like in the deepest reaches of the arcadian ocean and like random islands very far from here it's mysteries so tovazan are wood giants that just kind of live in the area and they are really definitely not as likely to murder you as some of the other things that are there but they do have uh pretty bad tempers and so they could definitely rip you limb from limb if they think that you're a foe. Mm -hmm. uh, there's thesis fields in there where there's just some Zenj warriors. They're Magically frozen. frozen in place. It's some kind seems to be like some kind of uh, some kind of a prison that uses magical stasis to make sure that people don't escape. That's right. And um, the Pathfinder Society, as well as others, tried to figure out what was going on, but. Basically, all the operations have been disrupted. Mm -hmm. And then the Trail of Burst Souls. That sounds safe. I mean, it's <laughs> fine. It just takes you to the northern banks of the River of Lost Tears, Linda. Mm -hmm. That's While okay. the graves are plentiful, explorers on the Trail of Burst Souls will find that few have been disturbed by passerby. Rumors abound that those who desecrate the mounds and barrows that mark the Trail of Burst Souls will find themselves prey for hungry spirits and vengeful hosts that stalk yeah, the night it's in fine. search of whoever brought them graves. See, the graves are safe. They're totally it's safe, totally good. Guys. All right, so next after Bandu Hills, barely in the alphabet, is the yes, Barrier, the barrier wall. wall. Yes. <laughs> the Barrier Wall is an enormous uh, and high mountain range that basically is 
like, sort of the northern border of the Mwangi Expanse. Like, so if you decide, like, well, there's a large region, like, where exactly does the Mwangi Expanse stop mm -hmm. in the north? The answer is at the barrier wall. Yes. <laughs> because <laughs> it's this giant mountain range there. And there's a lot of really important, like, mountains and then even locations within the mountains. So, Earthspear is the legendary location that holds the last re records of Old Mage Jutembe. Yep. Who knows if it even exists at all anymore or where it could be. Uh, it's very it's, elusive. Yeah. The, the legends also say that the old the, uh, that Old Mage Jutembe secured it with powerful magic that causes it to move around and would only be revealed when people need it most and all sorts of things who knows what's going well, on just ask that. baba yaga where where to find it mm -hmm. uh then there's haldun which are um basically uh is a fortress located in rahadum and is the headquarters of a network of sentries that prevent creatures from the sodden lands from heading out to the north so it's in the barrier mountains it's on the rahadum side because, well, remember, when you go across it, you're not in the Wongi Expanse anymore. You're in some of those northern Gurundi nations. There's the Tomb of the Thousand Tusks. Mm -hmm. Which be has been, was believed to have been built by an Osra to essentially be a bait for foolhardy adventurers. Yep. And there's all sorts of rumors like that maybe it contains an Imperial Lord's disembodied head and other things. Maybe it's just continually expanding deeper and deeper. There's only one way to find out, and that's to go adventuring there. Yep. Uh, there's the Tower of the Stone so, I mean, if it wasn't already clear, this uh, this section is completely full of adventure hooks for GMs to pick up and run with, and stories for players to tell their GMs, like, hey, you know, yep. I think my character might want to try to figure out what the deal with that is. Mm-hmm. Tower of the Stone Wardens is, like, legit before this book the only place that I knew that was in the Barrier Wall. Because mm -hmm. it's very deeply, it's, like, very deeply connected to the Citadel of the Alchemists of Artokis Kuran, Who, you know, was in Lost Omens Legends and we talked about that kind of stuff before. Mm -hmm. So, um, the Stone Wardens are druids who operate in the central mountain range that, in the section that's between Mwangi Expanse and Thuvia. And they basically are going to safeguard hidden locations that some of which are connected to uh, that Thuvian related stuff. And that's kind of the barrier wall. It's giant mountains. You're kind of almost not in the Mwangi Expanse at that point. You know what's definitely in the Mwangi Expanse? The Mwangi Jungle? The Mwangi Jungle, yes. The largest tropical rainforest in the inner sea region. That makes sense. I really think that's in the Wongi Expanse. If it wasn't, I, it I would be like, why is it not there? Why? It, it's just confusing. Mm -hmm. um, so the Wongi jungle, sometimes accurately called the Okoda Drainage Basin because of Lake Okoda, is a basically incredibly lush. It's got a huge amount of water. The jungle's trees grow up to 150 feet high. Individual trees can be up to 300 feet high. There's all sorts of animals. And it can be very dangerous, but mm -hmm. also full of mysteries and really cool stuff. So, obviously, the Mongi jungle is a huge portion of the Mongi expanse. It has a ton of really cool things in it, such as uh, Quilipoth runestones. Not necessarily a good thing, but pictured here, I believe, is a Quilipoth runestone. Yes. Uh, they, there's the area of bloodletting songs. Doesn't that sound lovely? Uh, where uh, supposedly demon worshippers sacrifice their victims here and the birds are the angry ghosts of the dead. The Colossus of Senbaji, which is a bizarre alien statue, not to be confused with the bizarre statue that was pointing to Zorakai. Uh, but this one is like only barely humanoid, but it has six fingers on each hand and it's pretty confusing and there's a dwarf it may, it, it, archaeologist it, studying it it may possibly have been set by desna it could have been it certainly seems to protect the it certainly seems to protect the people who live near it i mean from i wouldn't put that past desna mm -hmm. speaking of things desna might be interested in the doorway to the red star is like a very legendary location in the um the tales of old age jatembe 
because of the fact that it is the site of a confrontation between Old Mage Jatembe and one of his several nemeses, the King of Biting Ants, who was a villainous sorcerer whose body was made up of a swarm of poison ants. And it is said to be a doorway to the Red Star, which is a.k.a. Akitone, and therefore contemplatives of a shock from Akitone uh, built the doorway. But it was flawed. Uh, There's the uh, the Hungry School, a column of driver ants 60 feet across and 300 feet long. Why not? That that travels about through the, through the, through the jungle and writes messages in an ancient dialect in, of Mwangi uh, based on like the way that the ants move and is, is followed by a group of diligent students. I'm sure that's not associated with the the, uh, the King of Biting Ants at all. <laughs> Definitely not creepy. <laughs> the, the forest of Agoiben is sort of a section of jungle which is called its own forest even though it's, it's really, you know, it's part of the Mwangi jungle. But it has um, this kind of phenomenon legend of the crackling tree where you just find this enormous golden tree that just spontaneously combusts. There's Gosra's Pool, a sacred site to Gosra, guarded by two guarded by two water elementals who can um, and the pool can provide great blessing to uh, to those who drink from its water. There's Holy Zatramba, which it was the greatest city of the Wangi Expanse about a thousand years ago. Which is not as long ago as you might think, given how old, like, Nantambu and the Mugambi are. Mm -hmm. Which is just, like, older than all of Earth's um, human history by a lot. Um, so it's not that ancient, but it is pretty ancient. And it was basically sacred location that was the head of a confederacy. Until it was lost to, until it was lost to demons. Although yeah, it has, I mean, like it most is, yeah. Although it is, uh, it is starting to, uh, it's starting to recover in in some ways. It's not like completely lost, and no one knows where it is or what its deal is. Yep. Still a very dangerous demon haunted area of the jungle. That's where true. your heroes may wish to adventure. Well, the problem is that there's now an adult green dragon who lives in there. It's it, because it's fun. Mm -hmm. um, and therefore, um, is kind of overselling the number of demons that are still there so that people won't bother her. Basically. Um, because it's like, oh, there's lots of demons. Um, you know, you don't want to go there. And that allows, that basically allows her to uh, restore the city back to its original, um, you know, oh, form awesome. because she's a worshiper of Phrasma, Uh because people think that there's lots of demons there. And she's still like an evil dragon, but if you're a worshiper of Phrasma who wants to help restore the city, then she might appreciate that. <laughs> Much more lost is the lost city of Erd. Well, given that it is literally the lost city of Erd, I would actually be a little bit disappointed if it was not lost. No one has the, and uh, no one has even the faintest idea where Erd once lay beyond in the jungle, and all accounts agree that Jatemba was exceedingly thorough in destroying the place. Little is known about it, although there are three paragraphs about it and only one paragraph about the pyramid of Kiyumu. Fair enough. So I guess. So little is known about it that we just had to tell you how little <laughs> was known, and it was very little. Well, to speculate about who is investigating it and what and what rumors there are and things like that. But the first sentence, little is known about the time yes, lost city of Earth. Yes, but, but, but little known and largely forgotten, forgotten is the, the Pyramid of Kitumu yeah. is a curious conical building, if indeed it is a building, overgrown by the jungle. So there you have it. Uh, the problem is with Erd, no one has the faintest idea where it is, whereas with Kitumu, you kind of know where it is, but you forgot it, and there's just these glittering fireflies there, and legends but nobody, speak nobody to a spirit or god of to fireflies. The, to the demigoddess who is said to live there for quite a while, so some grave misfortune may befall the region. 
Well, I hope it's not Nimbaloth, because it's always Nimbaloth uh, when there's, like, lights or fires or things like that. It would be more interesting if it wasn't Nimbaloth. Mm -hmm. And safer for the region, because that Nimbaloth is, is very dangerous. Um, Renagi Circle is, I believe... No, what, what's pictured there is the tree that's splitting from the Forest of Agloban. Yes. Not Renagi Circle, but it is a dense circle of jungle cypress. And basically, there's a legend that there are two great spirit brothers, Renage and Golo Kongo. Except Golo Kongo was basically the the mean brother, like in a lot of when there's two brothers situations. Who, uh, but yeah, who got into a fight with his brother, and the nicer brother won this time. Unlike in the classic evil brother, good brother scenario, where the good brother is like killed and then has to come back from the dead or something. And was imprisoned inside a giant tree. There, there's your oh, actually, to what's there's going on with the mother of fireflies. The mother of fireflies. It's actually so, chaotic evil, but yes. is not Nimbaloth. So yes, it's different. I got, I got what I wanted there. Mm -hmm. In fact, I probably did a design pass on this deity stat block, and then forgot that it was the one that was connected to the pyramid. You've done a design pass on a lot of things. That's that's fair. Another That's another fair. pretty dangerous place to go is the uh, River Mjer here. Uh, plants along the riverbank grow sickly and weak. Um, at night, curious lights appear in the sky above the river's headwaters, and those who travel there after sunset, re sunset report hearing a few animal sounds, but sometimes a curious buzzing noise. Um, most why, but why do the gnolls have sky metal weapons? Why, well, there's gnolls with sky metal weapons. Sometimes bodies appear with with curious wounds as if their brains were removed. Uh, with curious wounds and their brains are removed and all sorts of weird stuff is going on there. But the gnolls with sky metal don't let anyone get close to figure out what's going on. So, But are they mana-wasted gnolls? They're not mana-wasted gnolls. Okay. There are no mana-wasted gnolls. Okay, uh, fair, fair <laughs> enough. All right, so there's also Saruk, which was founded almost a millennium ago, which again... Sounds really old and should be, but with the world of Golaren, that's really new compared to the Mugabia, which is just way, way, way more ancient. Uh, Saruk was a pilgrimage site, like, you know, a little bit after uh, the time when uh, we were talking about Holy Zatramba being a very important religious area. So maybe it was during Zatramba's time. Mm -hmm. And basically it was very important to the archon winloss the archon lord is an imperial lord and aradin and you know aradin um so hundreds of pilgrims came there and the herald of winloss the penultimate quill on uh, uh, on just sh showed up and was like hey aradin it's gonna be great that you're here and then that didn't happen. So, so now, so then, then Angwasi is like, oh, crap. Now we have all these pilgrims who are stranded far from home and all, all, all the, all these problems going on. I guess I'll, I guess I'll stick around. Um, yep. But. And now there's just randomly the Herald of, <laughs> of, of Windless is just here. Like dealing with these, these poor people who wanted to. Find Aradin did like, not did not find I, I Aradin. I would really like to go home to heaven. I was. I, I'd like I was, to come back home to heaven. And I, I've been I've been stuck here for five generations, and I would really like to go back home. But the, and, and they're like, but we have this. We have all this lore. We have all and this lore. Every, everything nearby is going to destroy us. <laughs> it's just like, okay, and okay. The, the, I can't abandon you. I will stay. The herald is too proud to beg help from other buddies to come, like babysit here, and so. <laughs> is trying to figure out another way to handle it. Thanks for gifting a sub, Numbat. There was a person in the chat who had not yet been gifted a sub, and Numbat has has generously fixed Thank this you. problem. Thank <laughs> you. Um, so seventh ye, we were talking about this. That is the the known Atlantis city. Everyone said there can't be a random Atlantis city. In the middle of the Mwangi Expanse? Like, why do you have these random ancient, like, Atlantis people in your Mwangi Expanse? It doesn't make any sense when when there were always rumors about it. But then it turned out the rumors were true and there was totally a city 
created by the Islanti heroine Sabbath when she was going on a rampage to destroy Idarius, the god of the serpent folk. Uh, she needed to have a giant city, and there was a whole serpent skull adventure path about this, but the bottom line is there's a giant city there now at its seventh year. Legit. Uh, <laughs> then there's Spiro Sparrow, which uh, seems like that it is a giant fortress. Who knows who built this fortress? But like, now it's some of a group of Katapeshi gnolls. Yep. And given that they're Katapeshi gnolls, you know that they might have some so they're not necessarily friends with the local Mwangi gnolls. Although although their current leader Gold they're Beetle trying has to, been trying under their, to under their leader. Yeah. They promised an end to the slave trade. Except well we'll see. Mm -hmm. Because their leader is, is kind of neutral, so maybe. Wants to start a knowledge nation and uh wants to turn Okino into a null run city state under the vassalage of Katapesh. So Actually stopping the slave trade when you're dealing with Okino and Katapesh, which are mm -hmm. like major holdouts to wanting the slave trade, is going to be a hard sell. But obviously it makes sense for Gold Beetle to promise that to the Wongi Knolls, who are not fans of yes. that situation. So that's just a really interesting dynamic. And that's the Mwangi Jungle. As we saw, it had like a million things in it. Because it's like a big part of the Wongi Expanse, you guys. <laughs> Um, alright, so, the Kava Lands are a peninsula that's kind of on the west coast of Mwangi Expanse. It's named after Kava, who you can see here. These yes. are Kava, these, these, uh, feathery, uh, feathery creatures who are often mistaken for primates. Yes. Because of their faces, but they are definitely not. They are not, um, they are sapient, which is, means that they are... They're not animals, which they are sometimes mistaken for. And they they hide around here. Do they have a centralized society? Do they have a monarch who presides over them and um, train black mama snakes that they are infamous mm -hmm. for fighting with uh, uh, alongside on their side? Mm -hmm. Nobody's really sure, <laughs> but it is definitely the Kava Lands. Where you might find kavas as well as all sorts of other creatures that live in the area. Huge as well. numbers of birds and insects. So actually, Joe, surprisingly, Chirocon, uh, Ripley's. surprisingly, it's not named for coffee, but it's actually named for these animals. Uh, but uh, wherever there's a leshy, I guess you can find leshies elixir coffee. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, there's. Um, there's a lot of other dangerous creatures around there. There are insects uh, that swarm around. There's a swimming beetle that is turtle-sized and can bite you and pierce skin. Kind of like a snapping turtle, but if it was a beetle instead of a turtle. There's the Kiru Risen Ruins. We talked a bit about the Mabaiki people um, in, one of the, in one of our previous episodes. It was their former capital city. That's right. Um... Uh, the civilization was ransacked after its people transformed. Um, but it's possible the inhabitants simply moved away in the aftermath of Earthfall at some point. Uh, there were rumors about a young boy who saved him a bikey leopard from a hunting trap. It was shown two visions, one of prosperity and one of despair. After the boy let, set the leopard free, he found his agony rewarded with a rich life and... Mabike leopards were then hunted down by those seeking their own fortune, which led into Kava territory, and people still continue to look for Mabikes and their divination legacy, but that's just desperate people who want to know what's going on. Mm-hmm. Uh, Umasi are uh, mentioned in this section as well. They are actually one of the more peaceful residents of the Kava Lands, even though they're one of the least peaceful residents, residents uh, of the Bandu Hills, which just seem, indicates that the Kava Lands are even more dangerous than the Bandu Hills. Yes. Since they are the people who were cursed and can't heal and need to, like, steal your organs and body parts to heal themselves. You can find more about them in Bestiary 3. That's right. 
Um, so you mentioned Lake Okta before. Yeah, Lake Okota is sort or of Okota, yes. the reason why the Mwangi exp uh, jungle is a giant jungle because it's sort of the drainage basin for Lake Okota, uh, which is it all the way at the center of the Mwangi Expanse is a bit far and away the major source of fresh water that is like the whole reason that the jungle is there. And geomancers suspect that it lies at the intersection of two major ley lines. Which, you know, geomancers are, they, they don't own ley lines. Uh, mm -hmm. They like, they own terrain magic. But these geomancers have both knowledge of terrain magic and ley lines. And that makes them think that the magic energy might have been what sort of sprang outward. And even more so than the water geology reasons uh, and ecolog ecological reasons, it makes this the heart of the Wangi Expanse as well. So. Who knows if those geomancers are right? One of the, the major forces that, that's changing things around in this region is the, the recent death of the Gorilla King has left a massive power vacuum. So a lot of folks in this area are looking to move into that. Nature despises a vacuum. Yes. Uh, and so there's the shores of Lake Okoda, because who doesn't want to live right on the shore of fresh uh, water? Like, predators love it, because... Things are going to come and drink from there. And there's rare nettle fruits that you can find uh, from the shore, which is very uh, extremely delicious and can only be harvested by those who hold their bodies still enough to hide their presence in the water. There's a lot of shoreside activity. And basically, that's where you're going to find a lot of just the, the landbound people who are around Lake Okoda but aren't either amphibious or just dwelling within the lake. Whereas when you're when you're looking at like Nem Shenzu, the Aruxi stronghold, you've got Aruxi, some of whom have swim speeds and better capacity to kind of move through the water. So that's why Nem Shenzu is right on the right on the shore. And even has certain underwater quarters and chambers to uh, help repel invaders such as Cheroka who are not as good at at holding their breath as long as uh, Iruxi can. And there's also, let's see, uh, Old Man's Well, which much like many locations, nobody knows the exact location of it. Especially if it has a name like Old Man's Well, which associates it with Jitembe. Mm -hmm. <coughs> um, then you know that it's probably going to, although in this case, it's not, the old man is not Jitembe. It's just an old man obsessed with discovering the secret to eternal life who, who burrowed deep into the lake after dreaming of the hole. Well, that's the, that's the legend that is associated with it. But really what you need to be worried about in terms of like the, the physical phenomenon is a, is a strong and sudden undertow in the lake well, sure. that can pull people down. Those are some of the stories that are associated with You can be with worried about it, but from. no one knows the exact location. Yes. Nobody knows why it's happening. There's also the Song of Extinction, which is basically an artifact that siphons the life from its victim and increases the lifespan of the one who wielded it. That seems very... Um, it's obviously connected to the lyrics of Extinction, which were uh, a major artifact that was in that area. I think it's probably, like... Part and parcel of the same thing. This uh, this creature you see illustrated here is the guardian of Lake Okta, a who is said to wrap around the spire of destiny, which is the towering spire of white rock that juts out from the exact center of the lake and is surrounded in mist. This creature, this guardian, is said to wrap around its base and um, give the answer to exactly one question to those who can sufficiently entertain it. That's right. But who knows if it's actually going to answer your question or just be a giant colossal albino snake. Mm -hmm. So that is Lake Okota. What about the Mugumu, Mugumo, or sorry, Mugumo Plains? Yes. So the Mugumo Plains are between the Muwangi jungle and the Kava lands. It is a savanna that has large amounts of fertile farmland and is named for its shade-providing fig trees. Which you've you can got, see in the background there. 
You've got the Turwell Lake, which is in the caldera of a long dormant volcano. And you have these clouds of gas that rise, uh, that rise out from it that can be deadly to those who are unprepared. Um, so the people who live nearby have special charms that they wear so that they can detect if the air is sufficiently poisonous and then clear out before they before they face true danger from it. That's right. There's the ruined city of Blood Salt, named for the iron rich salt that gives the that gives the ground around there its color. Um, the excavations have re revealed uh, people sprouting dragon like wings and flying through the sky. Um, so there's all sorts of theories about. What, what what was going on there? Although one of the one of the biggest theories is that one of those poisonous glass clouds may have been what was the cause of the city's doom. And maybe the dragon winged people are disembodied souls, just like those birds that were disembodied souls. Being disembodied souls of the residents is a, just a common theory mm -hmm. about what anything could be in the Mulligan Expanse. Yes. Uh, then there is Agrixia, which is basically uh, a sunken ruins of an old cyclops city it's there's obviously it's it's beneath the shores of terra lake so there's poisonous air there's being under the lake there's silty waters there's volcanic issues there's boggards drinks and wear crocodiles it's just not the best place to go but there are legends claiming that the uh, the free captains of the shackles use this area as a place to bury their treasure. And so some people go there to try to find their buried treasure. And researchers who want to know more about the Cyclops civilization of Golgan uh, can come to this area to try to study it. Due to the fact that it's so dangerous that it might be one of the places you can actually find some Golgon stuff that hasn't been like pillaged already up until this point. Mm-hmm. And there is the small village of Kyoto, mm -hmm. a, 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 a populated by Banawat humans and Imbeke dwarves. That's right. Who have learned to um, who have learned to um, deal with the uh, the nearby dangers and have are well known for their talented artisans. That's we'll cool. continue today with the crashed Sky City Co. The ruins yes. of Ko. From the fabled Shori Empire, who were best known for their flying sky cities. As it turns out, if you make flying sky cities, that tends to be something that's pretty famous about you. Nobody cares about their aeromancy and and aeromantic infandibulum technology, except for in so much as it created flying sky cities. I'm sure that they had a rich culture of many, many things that were not sky city or sky related. Such as, I don't know, um, we, we mostly know about their amazing sky cities. So... Such as, yeah, such as, well, in this one you can find, um, this is a place where you can find all sorts of poorly understood ancient magic mechanisms oh, sure. that are still working, not necessarily for their originally intended function. And yep. it can be very, it can be certainly very perilous. Um, but there are all sorts of artifacts and secrets that remain um, that remain yet to be discovered. That's right. Ko was very magi technology. So using magic to develop mechanisms that would support the magic. So uh, Ko was actually the very first flying city of the Shuri Empire. It was considered very important to the Shuri Empire. Where some of the others came crashing down because of magical issues. Uh, Ko was crashed after, supposedly, after being destroyed by the Terrasque, the Herald of Ravagug and Spawn of Ravagug. So that is a popular rumor that has not been verified of what happened to Ko. Morning, Trippy. Thanks for the cheer. Thank you. So, in terms of what's going on there, uh, there's constructs and elementals that are that are roaming the area, and Ko has a, a way of having new dangers that no one had previously seen pop up when people go and have deep explorations into the city. Although, uh, the clan of Merids that used to defend it um, 
are are not defending it anymore. So does that mean that it's safer to explore now, or just that the dangers have shifted in an unpredictable way? That's a good question. Also, marriage. There we go. There's always got to be. There's always got to be marriage. So you have to cite <laughs> marriage. Them in so you the... have to cite marriage OGL. in the OGL. <laughs> Every lost omen. Yes. Now we see our marriage in... I was wondering where the marriage were in Wong Expanse, and now we know. Yeah, we know. Um, so, um, there's a bunch of different portions of the city, but the thing about it is that the impact crater was big enough that the rain, heavy rainfall formed a lake, and so the part that was the upper part of the city because of how it fell is deep enough in the crater that it's now underwater. And also, there were plater gates to the plate of water that filled the city cistern, which looks like it's also part of what caused the lake, and it's just, it's a giant lake now. But all the merits themselves may be gone. They're still in, uh, an illusory labyrinth. Yeah, you know. Down there, which they used to hide their treasures. Everyone likes illusory labyrinths. I would, I would hide my treasures in an illusory labyrinth if I could. <laughs> It would be funny. There's also crystalline creatures, and there's like a quick sidebar if you're like, oh, wait, we want to make a crystal zord or something else with crystal corruption. Uh, you can basically put crystal corruption on something strikes, give it a weakness to sonic damage because of its crystalline nature. Maybe make a glass ooze by starting with a regular ooze, turning the acid damage to sonic, and letting it dispel some magic. So... There's a lot of ways to very quickly create some of these crystal creatures that you can find in Ko. So while the upper city fell into a giant lake of its potentially its own creation, the lower city is kind of now at this point is like sticking out of the lake onto the land. It's got birds roosting at its top at its top reaches. Um, and this, this part, as you might imagine, since it's been up and exposed to the elements and things like that, has been damaged more over time. Also, um, if you thought that the plane of water stuff that was going on deep below was the only planar anomaly going on here, that it's not. There's a, there's a faulty planar gate that just opens and closes sporadically to the plane of shadow here. Look, okay, it's still better than Ulduvai with the, the plane of Shogoth situation. Yep. Uh, fair enough, fair enough. But, yes, that's very dangerous. And there's also the Fields of Glass, which are sort of the pulled remains of the crystal structures of the city that kind of created a Field of Glass. is super malfunctioning. It propagates more crystals. And somewhere in there, many believe, is the, like, the main engine of Ko. But it's a Field of Glass with those that's where the crystal creatures that we yeah. were talking about. So, it's super dangerous. The crystal corruption is an incapacitating disease that will sicken you, make you vulnerable to Sonic, and eventually petrify you. But the petrification is is crystallization rather than stone petrification. And that's not great if you don't want to be turned permanently into crystal and just stuck there. Now, if you do, then you should get crystal corruption uh, as quickly as you can. And that's sort of the, the situation where as, um, like, their oozes that are around there are kind of custodians of the area. Uh, Philip points out uh, that there's no crystal to flesh spell. If you're very lucky, then maybe a stone to flesh spell will work. Uh, so then there's Uomoto. And Uomoto are, uh, uh, are a group of people, people who, who live near the ruins. Yep. Um, they um they kind of scavenge the ruins for awesome stuff that's yeah. in there sometimes there's a high a high proportion of people who are magically gifted um that's right and um there's a there's a strong focus on uh, magical education particularly magical education and tradition of uh, and a tradition of using sleeve tattoos to gradually growing sleeve tattoos to mark um, accomplishments and progress in education. Yep. And they also use falcons. But, uh, they, they try to nurture falcons who are having trouble and then release them back into the wild, especially eagles, as part of their falconry. Uh, mm -hmm. 
It's Tinkering, for- improvisation, and flexibility and creativity are quite valued in uh, in Umoto society. Yep. I mean, it makes sense since they are learning from this all this weird stuff in these ruins near there. Umoto's really understand what's going on with Ko better than pretty much anybody else. But still, nobody really knows everything about what, what happens in Ko. And some say that Uomoto may be descendants of survivors from Ko's apocalyptic issues. And there is some credence to that because you can get the Shuri Aromancer uh, Uncommon Human Ancestry feat if you are Uomoto. So, mm-hmm. that kind of that kind of gives you an idea that they might be descended or at least have some connection to it from exploring the ruins enough times. Uh, another thing is that Uomoto have that kind of stereotype that's also what I know was very popular one at MIT where Linda and I went of like working super super hard and, when, and then also uh, celebrating mm-hmm. hard when yes. when you're when you're not working. And that's just, I think it's generally something that is is often seen in a lot of places that do, like, deep engineering. And Uomoto absolutely do that because of what they're trying to figure out from Ko and all of the magic technology that they're, they've are they scavenged out and are studying and understanding. And you can see here both on the, on the earrings of the, of the woman on the left page and on the decorations in the building on the, on the right page that uh, crystals and color are an important part oh, of the absolutely. aesthetic. Oh, absolutely. And these crystals will not give you crystalline, whatever the thing is, crystal corruption. Yes, that's true. They're good crystals. <laughs> All right, so let's move on to the Screaming Jungle. Yes. So we've talked about it a lot of times throughout the book so far. It's not a necessarily a a nice place because it's the screaming jungle. You hear primates and birds echoing their screams throughout, which gives it its name. That's like the main reason. It actually is howler monkeys mm-hmm. and birds, but it is deeply dangerous as well uh, to live up to its name. It's not just some friendly place that also has howler monkeys in it. You basically come in here, it kind of feels almost dreamlike. You've got these eerie sounds that are coming around. There's There's... not many people who brave this grieving jungle. There's uh, there's one settlement, Osibu, but but beyond that, like, there aren't that many others. That's right. And we'll get to Osibu eventually in the settlement section. But, um... That is a major settlement of Mwangi Expanse, and so it's not going to be in the the general yeah. Screaming Jungle section. Uh, it's basically southeast of the Bandu Hills, which we've we've done before, and just kind of just south of Mwangi Jungle. And so you can get to it from the eastern edge of Vidrian. And this is uh, this this piece you see on this page is Dbede, which is a fifty foot. Uh, fifty foot base, hundred foot tall, um, termite colony. Yep. It's a giant tower of termites. It almost looks like a liquid light material is constantly in flux because so many termites are climbing on it, and it's always growing taller because it's a giant termite colony. Mm-hmm. There's also a loco loba which is basically a city of biloco and iloco who are crocodile snouted fey who stalk the mwangi jungle and feast upon your flesh i mean a lot of things like to feast upon your flesh but biloco and iloco really like to do that and they even have a city that is based upon feeding on your flesh Littered with bones and other miscellaneous objects that cannot be digested when they feed upon your flesh. Don't go there. They can patch up their buildings with it, though. Or use it to make weapons. And uh, they've got cauldrons. It's and also the cauldrons are, are the cauldrons are there in order to feed upon your flesh. Also, it's surrounded by the hideously dense maze of traps. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's easier to just have you killed by the trap and mm-hmm. then pull you in and throw you in the cauldron. 
Uh, then there's a sidebar about the fate of Ulduvai, which we kind of mentioned before, where Ulduvai was the last Sky City that did not fall. And uh, even when some of the Sky City magic wasn't working, but they, they used some weird dark tapestry artifact to keep going. And that did them in eventually. It plunged into ruin and that was it. Other than the one that's still flying in near, um, like, over Tan Shop, but that's a mm -hmm. different story. That is true. Yep. Uh, there's also the Career River in the Screaming Jungle. And as you can see in this picture with the, like, fish that has bitten off somebody's gauntleted hand, uh, it's not safe either. There's barracudas and tiger fish in there. There's large snakes that drop on prey, but usually not humanoids because, well, Humanoids are usually too large for that. They're too big for the snakes in the most case. But mm -hmm. if you're a small halfling, Still, maybe. it's a, it's a, it's a conduit for trade. It's the trade, it's the trade route between cities within Vidrian and, uh, connection, and yep. connection over to Mizali. Um, most likely, if you went into the Screaming Jungle, you might have been traveling along the Corridor River for trade. Yes. Then there's Mount Dewama. Yep. That is basically the biggest mountain in the entire region of the Screaming Jungle. Like, when you're there, you're going to see this giant mountain over there. It's kind of a holy place to the locals. There are rumors of a debris field that leaves a trail to Olduvai. Mm -hmm. And there are peoples who live there who uh, don't live anywhere else, um, such as the Zothians, who have um, so who are somewhat centaur-like, uh, and that they have uh, torsos like some Ruth, like a Ruxies and four-legged lower bodies. Uh huh. Hey, we got frozen again in the picture. Um, we were talking about Mount Dawama, and. Mount Duwama has got a bunch of interesting creatures. There's Zothians who are like centaurs with Uruxi torsos. And uh, there are Derhi, powerful winged gorillas who were allies of the Shuri. There's just uh, a lot of interesting stuff in that area. And the PF1 Crucible of Chaos can tell you more about what's going on there. Mm-hmm. There's also the waste, the waiting ones, which are the residents of Rastal's ruins, who are tieflings, possibly influenced by demonic forces. Rastal being the devouring kingdom, uh, located south of Zatramba during the Zatramba era, before that whole demons destroying Zatramba thing happened that we were talking about in Zatramba, uh, and so Rastal used to include a lot of different people, but. Uh, well, now there's mostly tieflings there. Rastal basically decided to consume its neighbors and led to conflict with the holy city of Zatramba. And there was a whole giant thing and they both got destroyed. Let's move on to the Sodden Lands. Yes, let's. So, we talked about them before and that there were lots of refugees because the Eye of Abendigo, the giant hurricane, basically racked the entire region and made made it into a, this is just very swampy, drowned area. And you know, there's boggards there now. They like swampy, drowned areas. Yeah, the, the nations of Lirgan and Yamasa are the two that used to be there. We talked yep. about them a bit earlier. They were rich, fertile farmland. We talked about how their refugees do the best irrigation possibly in the entire inner sea region. And some of them uh, retreated to join other cultures in the Wongi Expanse, including some of the dwarves. Uh, but there's... Also, in the Sodden Lands, obviously, there is some connection to the Elemental Lords Kelizandri and Shora, the Elemental Lords of Water and, and Air. Uh, they're, where Lurgan and Yamasa once stood is now basically a flooded city whose descendants live in the tower tops above dark and murky waters. 
There's boggers, there's crocodiles, it's just a dangerous swamp. It's like in Monty Python where the castle sank into the swamp, except for everything sank into the swamp. Yes. Let's see. So there's a there's a big shout out about um generally about the area around the it looks like the capital of um the capital of Lyrgen. There's also a uh, a famous Boggard Alchemy shop uh, within a Boggard village on the Frogmarts River called Codslow's Concoctions that gets a call out here. Uh, Flip Town. Oh, but but look at the but look at the Boggard here on uh, the facing page with his with his tiny little construct toy and his. Yep, I think that's got that's that's probably the. Um, the bogger. Yeah, well, because it talks about him making out chemical toys and things yep. like that. So there you go. He is cool looking. Uh, Flip Town was founded by a good aligned uh, Grip League champion who kind of just decided to create a new town. It's a roving Grip League village that kind of sails through the Soddenlands, which is pretty cool. You know, you always got to have your floating village somewhere and. This is one. This is one of the floating villages. I'm sure there's. I know there's more. I know there's like a. There's a big floating city in um in the Minata Archipelago in Tian Sha as well. Um, Kopitang, the uh, former capital of uh, Yamasa, um, the survivors of uh, some of the survivors of Yamasa. Um, continue to make return to the return there every year on mm -hmm. a pilgrimage and there's many different cults of the eye of abendigo like there's some who wear god's masks there's boggard cults who think it's the eye of gogunta the demon lord of boggards uh, that's that's over there obviously uh there are still major rivers in this area because of the fact that that's part of why it was such a lush um farmland in the past there's herentum that's the capital of lyrgen or former capital of lyrgen which is now completely flooded this towers were a sanctuary and some people survived because they were major astronomers so they had giant towers so they could have telescopes at the top and it flooded to such an extent like it, that's a lot of flooding that you needed to be at the top of a very very tall tower, or you pretty much not only drowned but it just stayed underwater. And basically, there were some people who were too stubborn to leave and just stayed using those towers as a new settlement. And the only reason that they've been able to hold together in such a dangerous area is by uh, allying with. Uh, the Kaijong, a brine dragon lighthouse keeper, and Rycina, uh, a a Naga scholar, to uh, to try to protect them, and um, but then there was a gate that appeared to the first world and brought a huge number of Fey. So now it's got all the city's got all this magical aid from all sorts of supernatural beings that it's using to to rebuild itself, but that that certainly comes That's with its right. own. It's own challenges. Eng's well, because Eng the Wanderer is like the eldest of, of seasons. That's also yes. where the Gripply uh, guy Flip went and got his his barge town from. So there's always fake gamblers in there. Um, we'll see Eng's well in a moment on the next page. Mm -hmm. So Hyrantum's lighthouse is 40 feet above the waves, which can just tell you how tall it was to begin with. Yeah. And that is the lair of the Brian Dragon Kaijong. Uh, whereas the Enclave is where most of Hyrentum's current residents live in the city center. It's just sort of a big portion of upper floors of towers. And it expanded with the Fae that Linda was talking about. Uh, Eng's Well is a gate to the first world that is so large you can sail an entire ship through it. And is believed to be one of the crossroads used by Eng the Hooded eldest of the seasons but also wanderers sometimes known as ang the wanderer and makes sense that it has led to trade and economic resurgence and that ang might be interested in the weather patterns maybe uh, like the weird ones that happened due to the eye of bendigo mm -hmm. 
Parallax University Library. The Parallax University used to be a, um, a world-renowned uh, university with a focus on astronomy, sciences, magic, and even space exploration. All that remains of the university now is its library, and the Naga we mentioned before uh, guards, guards the library carefully and personally decides which visiting scholars will be, will be allowed to peruse its tomes. Mm hmm Also, uh, apparently the book cover image is, is fairly... Yeah, I already um, took care of it. Oh, you already took care of it. Cool. Um, so there's the South Planetarium, which is basically a planetarium since everyone loved astronomy in Lurgan. But uh, now it is an underwater fortress for malicious aquatic monsters. So if you want to get into the submerged planetarium, you're going to have to contend with them. There's also the Terwa Lords, a, a growing power base in the area of the Soddenlands that are an aggressive group of Eruxi who kind of gained some influence by attacking their more peaceful neighbors and just kind of conquering whatever they could. Their leader uh, is an evil lizard folk lord who is a seer and claims to have prophetic dreams that require the complete unification of all of Rooksies and Sunlands. You can decide uh, how accurate that is. They're kind of a warrior meritocracy. And just because uh, they have this leader who's neutral evil, uh, that a lot of the Terwild Lords are not necessarily evil, but they are very aggressive and are willing to, to fight to take, take all of that territory. Mm-hmm. Terwa structure it talks also about how uh, Terwas build their structures and handle things. They tend to, they tend to be nomadic and uh, make good use of that in order in their tactics, um, setting up. Um, they can, yeah. So they they might like use their own temporary homes as traps for invaders. And yep. it talks also about the sorts of jewelry and art that they favor here as well. That's true. They also have shamans and seers who are advisors and leaders. And, of course, uh, like many other Ruxi, astrology is considered very important to them. So stars and, and uh, astronomy and astrology are important in, in just in general in the Sodden Lands area because of Lurgan and also the... Uh, the Terwa Lords. Speaking of um, the Terwa Lords, there's also the Terwa Uplands. That is a... A forested mountain region, which is home to many of the Mbeke Dwarves. Yep. It has uh, one of the original Sky Citadels, Cloudspire, and as well as a variety of other towns and cities. That's right. And, and the cloud dragons that we uh, that we talked about before when we were talking about the uh, the Mbeke dwarves. Really, this is a great companion section to the section about the Mbeke dwarves in general. So you've got a bunch of places here. Kalerang is the second largest city of Mbeke dwarves, and it's definitely in the Terwa Uplands, which is in the southeastern corner of the Sodden Lands. Uh, as you might expect, since the Terwa lords were in the Sodden Lands, this is. Uh, kind of to the south of the sodden lands so it's like right next to it but it is an uplands because it's rocky and mountainous whereas the sodden lands is more of lowlands and more drowned and um, kind of swampy now mm -hmm. there's the storm well which is a kind of a hidden area with a permanent portal to the plane of air where uh there's a maelstrom called the storm of fangs and the storm well is the final burial site of cloud the cloud dragons that first came into the terwa uplands is that what's depicted over here over and on, this, the, on that side yeah with um, the lightning and the with the lightning and all the dragon bones i think so philip ben says the fabled dragon graveyard yes Yeah, not it's very obscure by gray fog, so that's gotta be the storm well. That's gotta be the storm well for sure. There's also the Valley of Ghosts, which has disorienting echoing sounds. 
But unlike most places where it's like, it's terribly haunted and you might meet this extremely powerful ghost, the, the extremely powerful ghost would be like, dangerous and something that the, the ghost uh the most famous ghost here is the ghost drummer a uh, who leads lost travelers out of the valley who is an extremely powerful ghost yes but, but is good aligned yes exactly and can um it can teach people a particular style of music and patterns that give them some control over the dead mm -hmm. and that is the terra uplands so moving on, we have Blood Cove. So all of the settlements have this really cool um, two-page opening spread where you get the resources that they have. So like Blood Cove's got like alcohol and drugs and mercenaries and things like that. And you've got the settlement stat block. So you know that they are a generally neutral, evilly aligned settlement nine. Known for being, uh, no known for pirates and the aspis consortium primarily yep. they also can have really powerful trade connections that let you get extremely high level extremely high level items yes. like level 15 items it are very very high but you have but to wait yeah. 3 to 6 days cuz they get it from their aspis connections uh there's a, a, a their rulers. There's you know like a neutral corsair, a neutral druid, a neutral evil ranger, and a neutral merchant. So even though it's neutral evil on average, a lot of their um, very important NPCs are not necessarily as evil. And the grand admiral is the neutral corsair who is elected for life, and there's a secret syndicate that's in there. You can see the map on the right side has some of the most important um, sections. You might you might also notice the uh, the water here is red. Is red. That's right. It's called Blood Cove for a reason. And the reason is that the water is red. That is the reason. <laughs> uh, so yeah, absolutely. There's ships from even Tiansha and Vudra, and um, so the Mangrove City. Mm -hmm. Well, part of, part of it is that um, part of it is that there's no such thing as contraband in Blood Cove, and that's part of why it's easy to find a wide variety of yes, good like there. drugs and and mercenaries and all sorts of things that might be illegal in other places too. So the Mangrove City is another sort of name for Blood Cove that's maybe a little less ominous than Blood Cove. But Blood Cove as an ominous name like is, is, is about right for the city. It's got these red waters, giant mangrove trees, and there's a cat neutral Grand Admiral who supposedly rules it, but a secret syndicate actually does. And yeah, it is a piratey Aspis evil merchant haven that somehow manages to have some amount of order without really having that much authority. And as we saw from the history, it's lasted for what it was it thousands of yeah. years. That is impressive. It just is. How do you even last for thousands of years if you have like a propped up like leader who is really ruled by a secret syndicate? Like that secret syndicate is very stable yes uh, i mean i guess it may not have had that syndicate yeah same syndicate maybe not character, but, but still the, the fact that there is a secret syndicate that keep probably has kept doing this and we know as instruction has been behind it for a long time and it's just continually propped up leaders while being a secret syndicate and keeping the, the city afloat like yeah sure it, it only has a modicum of order but that's still that's super impressive uh so life in blood cove is obviously very centered on commerce because that's why it's still there. And, uh, the markets are a huge central feature. And I agree with David that the dress pattern is awesome. Yes. It's also it's also known for having great food, as you can see um, depicted up here in the in this image yeah that's one thing you don't think about this is a city 
that has been around for a long time. It's got people from all over the world, including Tian Sha and Vudra, that are coming here uh, because it's a, a sketchy port of call where you can kind of buy and sell whatever you want. And it's known for that. And so it has a really great food scene because of that fact. It's got uh, its own food styles. It's got food styles that can be based off of other cultures. And there's an entire page here that yeah, talks pretty much all just about, about food, about food and um, how they do different meals and where their supplies come from and all that kind of stuff. It's obviously an incredibly evil place. And you probably don't want to go there for a variety of reasons. But it's got a great food scene. <laughs> I mean, PCs might find themselves trying to trying to buy things or sell things. That's right. That they couldn't necessarily find anywhere else. So there are shipworms that are an issue because of the warm red waters of the area. And they love to eat your ship. Kind of chewing away at the wood. They can deal a massive amount of hull damage potentially. Ah, uh, but they're delicious. They're mm. a delicacy, and sailors, sailors like yeah. to, they they want revenge. Yes, on the ship eat them for revenge. <laughs> yes. Stephen wants to know if good food equals evil. I would say not necessarily. It just depends on the food. Correlation is not the same as causation, Stephen. That's true. <laughs> like, do you want? I mean. You, you could think about it in certain ways. It's like bacon. Is it a good food? Is it evil? I don't know. Steven says Mark equals evil. Nah. I don't think so. But uh, I'm obviously biased. But this is biased reaction. <laughs> so, uh... At any rate. Uh, Blood Cove, it also talks about the weather in, uh, the weather in Blood Cove. It has, uh, as, as fitting, it's tropical climate, has a dry season and a wet season. Yep, but it actually is a little more stable than some of the places in the Mulligan Expanse between those seasons, which is part of what makes it a good place for a trade hub. Uh, they have some of their own unique holidays, like Admiral's Advent, which celebrates the Grand Admiral. As for religion, uh, religion, as you'd expect from a city that has people from all over the world, uh, the religious practices are, are diverse. Uh, although popular deities include Besmara for piracy well, and, sure. and Norgorber for, for all that Norgorber does. And yes. also storm deities like Gazra and Haifeng. Uh, the people of Blood Cove are quite diverse. Sometimes referred to Blood Cove as the melting pot of pirates. That seems pretty accurate. You, you know, I mean, there's Tengu and monkey goblins and hobgoblin mercenaries and all sorts of peoples and ancestries throughout the area. And this page here talks a lot about um, styles of clothing and jewelry and what people what people favor. And they obviously have some pretty stylish outfits. Yes. They're super evil, but they do have good food and stylish Not outfits. Not everyone in Blood Cove is evil. You just said that at the beginning. Yeah, but it's a neutral evil overall settlement. That is true. That is true. Speaking of, a lot of them have these red hats because there's another person with one of these red hats that's here. Yes, I'm on this page talking about the Auspice Consortium. And the different ranks, the, the bronze, silver, and gold agents. Each one stepping up the level of area in which the agent has power. Aspis Consortium are just the ruthless merchants who are constantly uh, been rivals of the Pathfinder Society because Pathfinder Society wants to put it in a museum and Aspis Consortium wants to sell it to the highest bidder who is usually evil because the evil people have a lot of money because they're evil and they're ruthless and they're willing to... Do whatever, including sell it to the highest bidder. Yes. And they, the Aspis Consortium even engaged in, um, in slavery in this area. Oh, absolutely. Until recently, not because they had a change of heart, but because they, um, but because the FPJ elves who they were, um, who they had been enslaving, uh, were able to have, a, were able to overrun their outposts and yep. drive them out. Yep. 
it's when it's bad for business, that's the only time they're going to stop doing some evil business thing. Mm-hmm. They pretty much care about, they pretty much are loyal to each other and themselves. And as for the rest of the world, meh. I mean, How this, you get this section has a good sentence about that. While others follow a code of law, the Aspis follow a code of coin. <laughs> That's basically true. Go. Yeah. Uh, another major faction here, obviously, the free captains of the Shackles, uh, pirates, and they are getting stronger in Blood Cove, but obviously this is a, Blood Cove is a melting pot that has survived for over a thousand years, so all sorts of factions have grown stronger, weaker during that time. They're competing with the Aspis Consortium here at this point, where the Aspis Consortium had, um, had more free reign before, but, uh, the free captains are kind of more united under some of their pirate codes and councils, whereas the Aspis Consortium are sometimes not loyal to each other and are more likely to one-up each other the for profit. The free captains have bigger, like, personal brands and names, which can, which gives them more opportunity to build clout within the city, but also paints a bigger target on their back and makes things more dangerous. But Blood Cove in general is a, is considered to be a good neutral meeting ground for pirates. Yep. From the Shackles. Absolutely. I mean, where else are you going to go? If you go somewhere in the Shackles, it's one of the pirates probably owns it. If you go to Illidan McGordy, there's all those Red Mantis, Zealots, and I mean, you don't want to go there. Mm -hmm. So, why not go to Blood Cove? It has good food. It does have it's, good it's food. It's also evil, but... You're a pirate, and you probably don't have met a lot of other evil pirates when being a pirate. So, when we're talking about the figurehead of Blood Co., we're talking about Hathwick Barzoni, that 13th level Corsair. Grand Admiral of the Fever Sea is, is a title that Hathwick has. He was elected by the descendants of the original pirates of Blood Cove. Like, imagine, like, these descendants have been descendants of the original pirates for like over a thousand years. Uh, now, how much authority does he hold? Not very much authority. Because of the secret syndicates that really do everything else. But, like, theoretically, he has resources to maintain the militia. So that's, that's what he likes to do. And he's certainly been, uh, he's certainly been carefully eyeing the shift in power politics in Blood Cove as, uh, as the free captains start to, start to take influence that was previously the purview of the Aspis Consortium. And thinking about whether, whether he might be able to use that to gain some additional personal power. Yep. And I mean, maybe he can, but on the other hand, somehow this arrangement has gone on for over a thousand years and... Something like this has not happened up until this point, or if it did, it got pushed back the other direction. So, you know, then again, this is the time that the PCs are playing in. So all of these things that have been in stasis for an unreasonably yes. long amount of time might all come to a powder keg well, if it's interesting I in your like campaign. To think about, I like to think about it like that, um, like that with the, the, the death of Arid and, and the end of Accurate Prophecy, that something fundamental shook loose in the universe that caused uh that caused some of these things that have been in stasis for so long that basically caused the the speed of change so you're saying so that aridin and prophecy are what caused the ridiculously long stability of certain i could see that because like some of the things that were stable are things like empires and societies that aridin cares about yeah right that were like ridiculously unrealistically stable so maybe he, that's my, maybe that's he my was helping canon, make is that things Aridin, stable is that Aridin caused that type of stability and and now things it's uh, now more things like are the more real dynamic, world more like the real world yeah i could see that i could see that i, I liked your head canon linda so aspis and sorcerer have their own lodge uh it's swankier than pathfinder society lodges but also much more evil and being run by the former Pathfinder Malika Fenn. Yep. Who worked as a double agent for a while 
and um and eventually decided that um uh, and eventually decided that um she was going to throw in all of her chips with the Aspis Aspis Consortium. That's right. And there's also the Castellani of the Fever Sea, which is where you can find Grand Admiral Hartwick in this in the center of Blood Cove. Uh, Free Trade Square is basically the place where you're going to find a lot of the best merchants. It never closes at any time during the day. It just changes what was out there, depending on when you're coming. There's also Elusive Snakes, which is why there's a picture here. Um, there's Zimbas, which are serpents that reside in Blood Cove but are very hard to track down. Kava exports of the Barzoni Trading House are basically do a lot of trading and exports. They are kind of rivals of the Aspis Consortium because they are a different group that is here. But they include shops such as Paulus's Herpetarium, which is where you, you can see the picture there of Paulus, who is the snake loving. Elven herpetologist. You can buy all sorts of uh, snake and reptile pets. Yep. Absolutely. No one in Blood Cove loves snakes and reptiles as much as Paulus. She may be researching dragons, too. Mm -hmm. There's mm -hmm. also a recipe for Blood Cove barbecue. If you, too, want to have some of Blood Cove's food seed. And I've heard that people in real life have made Blood Cove barbecue and liked it. There we go. Uh, yep. Mm -hmm. The Pirate's Hook is a basically a tavern, I think. Is that right? I think so. It's a yeah, it's a major tavern yeah. that is beloved by pirates and is run by a former pirate. You could try a drinking contest against her, but nobody's won to date, which wow. That's pretty pretty impressive. She probably is one of those characters who is much stronger in her ability to hold alcohol than her level implies. Yes. And then finally is the Witch Light Inn, which is, it seems like a regular inn during the day, but then you see these blue, like, will-o'-wisp-like flames that d certain residents see. It's not this, always the same person twice. It's like... Are there ghosts? Are there witches? Like, what's going on? And uh, it's mysterious, it's cheap, and most newcomers will be likely to stay there. And the secret is that the innkeeper is not a witch. It's planted by the Aspen Consortium who controlled the inn. Tries to get people to loosen their tongues by plying them with fine food and drink. And bring those secrets back to the Consortium. But still doesn't answer why the lights are there. Like, nobody really knows. So that's it for uh, Blood Cove. That seems like mm -hmm. probably a good place to stop. And we yeah. can start with Jaha next time. Sounds good. Stump Monkey says the end is a witch. It's a witch. All right, so let's say bye to YouTube. Bye, bye YouTube. YouTube.